Hello? Hello? Okay, this does work, right? So I think it's time to start. Oh no, my laptop clock says it's still one more minute, so I'll wait for that then. Okay, so my laptop says now it's 2.30. Um, then let's get started. Um, hi, I'm Leonard Pottering. I work on Systemd, as you might know. But uh, this project has very little to do with Systemd. It's a little side project I started um, uh, uh, last year. And uh, yeah, I'd look like to introduce it to a little bit of a broader audience. Um, I think this is a really I, like the reason why I wrote it is because there was nothing like that, that before, which really, really surprised me, given that the ideas that it implements are actually pretty basic computer science, and it's really surprising that this is not a more uh, well-established um, thing already. So CA-Sync um, is what the project's called. Um, why did I call it like that? Like, first of all, it uh, takes the idea of a content addressable file system. Like, every one of you knows that, like, Git is one of those. Um, and combines it with the idea of rsync. I'm pretty sure everybody of you also came, like everybody who comes to this conference, I'm pretty sure knows both Git and, and rsync. The idea is to uh, take these both two ideas of the rsync algorithm and the Git concept of content addressable file system and combine them into one. Um, that doesn't describe what it's good for. It's good for what the long name says. It's a content addressable data synchronization tool. So ultimately, it's a synchronizer for file system trees for cases where you have very, uh, like many similar trees. Um, this could be, for example, for um, if you want to distribute OS images, right? Like you build a Fedora image, and then you want to distribute it to lots of machines, and you want to do it repetitively because you, 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 you want to do updates. And these trees are generally are very similar, right? Like they fix a bug here, and they fix a bug there. But in almost um, all way, they're identical. So uh, yeah, the use cases are delivering OS images, which is the same thing as a container image or IoT image. It's also the same thing as a VM um, image. Um, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. Um, another use case that there is is about uh, um, backup and uh, synchronization of home directories. It's suitable for all of these things because they, they all solve kind of a similar problem, right? Like frequent um, distribution of some big directory tree or some big um, uh, bl block device from one machine to another. Um, yeah, and we want to be able to take benefit of the redundancies that there are. Um, CA Sync is a tool that operates in two different layers, depending on, on uh, how you decide to use it. First of all, it's a tool that operates on the block layer. And secondly, it's one that works on the file system level. Specifically, you can use CA Sync to deliver images um, that are basically XT4 disk images, like, like something that you would mount as a loopback device and then can access. It can also act more like a tarball concept where it uh, operates one level further up 
um, where what you actually distribute to, to people is an is a entire serialization of a file system tree. So, uh, yeah, it's a tool that can deliver both of these things because I realized that that's, like, depending if you're more in the IoT world, you end up more um, delivering actually block layer images. If you're more in the VM world, uh, VM like world, that's what you also do. But if you're in a container uh, person, you probably more um, do it with tarballs on that level. I wanted to support both because the concepts are ultimately very similar. Um, so what does it actually do? It's going to be fairly technical, what I'll tell you. But I think it's interesting, so that's why I'm telling to you. So what the tool actually does is, on the block layer, it's easy. It just reads every block one after the other. On the file system layer, it does something very similar. Um, you could call it a tars up the file system tree. It's not actually um, tars, though, that I'm using for reasons that I'll explain later. But uh, conceptually, it's the same thing, right? So you, get a, you, you, you put the tool. Um, on some, some block device or on some file system tree, and what comes out in the first um, step is you get a serialization of it. In the second step, uh, we take the serialization and chop it up into blocks, right? We split up um, the, the serialization into chunks. Um, these chunks um, are, do not have uh, the same size always, but the size is determined um, depending on the contents of these chunks themselves, right? It uses um, the core component of the rsync algorithm. I mean, most of you, you will probably play around with rsync in your lifetime, um, probably didn't even know what the amazing thing about the rsync algorithm is, because like most people just use it for synchronizing directory trees, and they think it's, it's about like figuring out what the changes are on one side towards the other side and then retrieving all the other files. But the rsync algorithm is actually much, much smarter than that. What the rsync algorithm does, and what was the novel thing when it was introduced somewhere in the early 90s, was that when you have one file here, and you have the same file on the, on the server side, but in a slightly different version, then it can go through this, that file, um, chop it up into blocks, basically doing what I'm doing here. That's why CA sync after all is called CA sync because it takes that inspiration there. Uh, chops it onto blocks, identifies each of these blocks with, um, because our thing is a little bit older, it's an MD5 sum and not something more modern, but uh, identifies all these blocks, then passes on the list of blocks to, to my receiving side. Um, this um, receiving side then figures out if it has the same blocks already. If it doesn't, it retrieves those blocks from the other side and puts them back together. This is ultimately what CI sync does too. So if you actually use rsync to synchronize file system trees, you should know there's actually something really, really smart in it. But it, in rsync, it only um, ever gets used if there actually is the same file, like a file by the same name on both sides. Only then the smart part about uh, rsync um, uh, uh, comes active. Anyway, so in CI sync, we take the serialization, we chop it off into a series of chunks. The, the, as mentioned, these chunks are split up uh, in, a, in a way where the, the, uh, um, their variable size and the, and the size is generated from a hash of uh, uh, what's inside of that chunk. So the idea basically is that the same data results in the same chunks. Um, and that why do we do this? Why don't we just use uh, equally sized chunks? The reason for that is that, um, well, you're a C hacker or something. You have your C file there, and you type something to in the beginning and something in the end, and then you save it, and then you make another change. Usually what happens is um, you shift everything a little bit. But uh, generally it stays the same stuff. But uh, if you would... Uh, uh, um, like, like, I have a long C file, right, and I write something into the middle. If I, if I then calculate the shah sums of everything and split up into equally distanced blocks, right, then everything until the first change will, uh, will have the same checksums because I didn't modify it. But starting from that change on, everything to the end of the file will be, like, there's a ripple effect. Everything to the end of the file will be, be broken because as I inserted my line of code, all the chunks will, like, they moved to and moved further on. So the idea with these variable-sized um, uh, chunks is that the, that the chunk size is determined by the contents. That has a big benefit. If you have this long text file and uh, um, you make one change in the middle, this change remains local, right? This, the, the block in the middle will change, but then what comes after it will eventually re, um, go back into the same uh, chunking uh, uh, algorithm. That is the idea of the rsync algorithm, and it's wonderful. So. Um, why do we do all of this? 
I mean, this is the explanation of what I just gave. Adding an extra byte somewhere at the front should not ripple into all the following chunks, right? It should only remain local. The algorithm actually implemented is something called bus hash. It's a cyclic hash function, just, just for completeness. I'm not sure I want to go into too much technical detail of this. It's awesome stuff. It's stuff that's unfortunately little known in, in the computer industry, or like, I mean, if you ask the right people, they all know about this, but uh, unfortunately, it's not as well known as it should be, really. Um, yeah. So now we took the long serialization. We split it into these, these chunks where the size is determined by the chunk uh, contents. Now we calculate a strong hash function of it, SHA-512 slash 256, that is. Um, for those who don't know, um, that's, a, that's a misspecified uh, uh, hash function that is like SHA-512, but it's not SHA-512. It's truncated to 256 um, bits. It's, ultimately, you can consider it to be equivalent to SHA-256, but it's a little bit faster to calculate on 64-bit on, uh, machines, so it's generally preferable. But uh, anyway. Long story short, we have now these, these set of chunks. We calculate the hash functions, uh, the hash values. And then we write these hash values into something we call an index file. So the index file is basically, it's really nothing more than a long list of hashes. And these hashes, if you have them all together, they define exactly a set of chunks, which define exactly one serialization. Now, uh, at the same time, actually, where we build the index, we also take these chunks and compress them individually, right? Um, these chunks have like probably a size of around 64K by default. Um, we compress them with some standard algorithm. It's uh, ZSTD actually in the current implementation. These individually files that all have roughly the same size, but because um, the, 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 the chunking algorithm spits out differently um, sized uh, chunks, uh, will be placed in a directory which we call the chunk store. The chunk store is very, very simple. It's just a big directory that contains um, files whose names are the SHA sums, like the identifiers, and the contents is just the compressed data of those chunks. And that's already all there is to see, I think. With this stuff now, we can build nice things, right? Just to recapitulate, like the summary of what I was just telling you, the algorithm behind CA sync is serialization, chunking, hashing and indexing, and compression and storage, right? The input of the algorithm is a directory tree or block device. The output of the algorithm is an index file plus a chunk store, which is just a special directory. So this is how we uh, create um, the concept that like, it's about CSync archive creation. Now we wonder about um, extraction. Ultimately, it's just the reverse of this. We acquire an index file from somewhere. We acquire the chunks listed there, identified by the hashes, from the uh, chunk store. We concatenate that again, turn it into a big, big serialization again, and we deserialize it again on a block to a block device or onto a file system tree. All right? So, uh, and that's all, all there is to the extraction step. So basically, yeah, extraction is the same thing as, as uh, packing it up, just the other way around. So. Why do we do all of this? Um, so that we can synchronize images on the other side. Because, um, as mentioned, the chunking algorithm makes sure that the same data uh, results in the same chunks. And because the chunks um, are identified by the hashes, which is basically yeah, what their content is, you can uh, now take benefit of a couple of things. First of all, um, deduplication within the image itself. right? Like if the image contains the same data a couple of times, um, it will re reference the same chunks over and over again. Um, but secondly, if you have lots of similar trees, like different versions of an operating system, like what this stuff is, what you will get, you will get a different index file each time, but most of the time the same um, uh, chunks are, are referenced. So, uh, um, yeah, you basically get a very efficient way to store many, many different versions of the same directory tree in a... In a in a, in, a, in a file system and sharing the most of the data that you have. So key difference to rsync again, rsync as mentioned does some of these things, is rsync is all about the file boundary, right? Like the, the funny, the, the interesting thing about rsync is the rsync algorithm that I mentioned earlier is that when the files exist on both sides, then they do also this chunking and the hashing and things like that. The key difference to rsync is that ca sync forgets about the file boundary, right? I first serialize everything, then I chunk everything up, 
and then I do the, the, the stuff. What's the big benefit of that? I can trace changes across file boundaries, right? If I have a, have a file that get re, gets renamed, right? rsync could never optimize that. For rsync, it would be one file that disappeared somewhere and one file that reappeared somewhere else. There would be no connection between it. It would not be able to share the chunks or tell the other side, oh, by the way, you can just copy the data from the file you already have that's just named a different, business, uh, little bit differently. CI sync is ca capable to identifying that perfectly, right? It will recognize similar stuff all across whatever it serializes. It also has a big benefit. Um, it lumps small files together and splits large files apart because um, this chunking algorithm is designed so that, uh, as mentioned, it spits out various sized chunks, and these are defined by the contents, but you have a couple of parameters you can work with. You can say, I want a mi minimum chunk size, I want a maximum chunk size, and I want an average chunk size. Um, the algorithm works that way that these goals are always met, right? So um, basically, if you have the serialization, um, then in lots of small files like we tend to have on Unix, for example, in Etsy, then these are uh, lumped together until a full chunk is formed. However, if you have large files, which you also have on, on Unix quite often, like for example a kernel, it gets split up into multiple little parts. This is a key difference, by the way, to, towards um, OS tree. Like in OS tree, um, uh, you know, the, the original model is that all the files are identified by the hashes, but basically every file gets its own hash. It's incapable of uh, figuring out that multiple f uh, files um, could be packed together um, to be more efficient. In this system, this is automatically um, the fact, because, again, we serialize first. That means small files are concatenated with whatever that comes next. Yeah, and then we chunk um, either um, having multiple files in one chunk or just having um, one file distributed among multiple chunks. Yeah, um, this is where our chunks are a lot more evenly sized, and we can recognize blocks on different files. We can recognize renames. We can moving everywhere in the tree. So yeah, why do we do all this again? Similar file system images result in mostly the same chunk files, and hence we can efficiently store um, many, many related trees. Um, the stream is also implicitly validated, right? Because these index files contain hashes of every single chunk. They ultimately define exactly this, this, uh, the serialization in all of it. So you get something like DM Verity-like behavior. A DM Verity, for those who don't know, is a, is a device mapper target that is that is supported by a Linux kernel um, that basically allows you to say that the system should not uh, even boot if the hard disk um, is not in a very well-defined cryptographic state um, that matches what the vendor of the operating system declared. Like uh, Chromebooks by Google use that heavily. We in Fedora and Red Hat don't really use it that much. But uh, the, the idea basically is that on every disk access, a cryptographic validation uh, takes place that whatever is read of it actually ma matches exactly the version that the vendor supplied originally. Um, CA Sync gives you that too. Um, what's also very nice is like, let's say you actually now put the index file on some web server and you put uh, the, the store, the chunk store on some web server. It's a very CDN friendly, like content delivery network friendly design. Because, uh, you know, in, in CDNs, CDNs usually pay for, for the, how many objects are actually retrieved from what you serve there. Um, because you can have control about the average, minimal, and maximum chunk size, you can pick um, how much you actually want to pay for delivering images to people, right? Like, first of all, uh, when they do download the stuff, um, they'll, they'll uh, um, be able to reuse whatever they have. But secondly, you can control exactly how much will be able to reuse and how much they have to retrieve new by picking the chunk size. And on the other hand, this uh, uh, results immediately in cost or no cost for you. Um, yeah, why all we do all this? When acquiring a new version of a file system image, we can uh, also uh, process an existing image that the client already has, right? Containers work like this very frequently. Like, for example, um, a good chunk of the Docker containers in the world probably built on a Ubuntu image, right? And uh, the way how, um, if you do Docker, um, they, they make it somewhat efficient to, if you have 10 different containers and they all are based on Ubuntu or all are based on Fedora, you, they do this layering thing, right? Like it's how they share data. But it's an explicitly a managed way to do layering. With uh, CA Sync, you can do something similar, but all of the sharing of blocks is done implicitly, right? Because if I, let's say, I have a package that happens to be built from Debian and a, a file system image that happens to be built from Debian and one um, of a newer version, um, and you pack them up with CA syncs, 
the serialization will result in, this, in mostly the same data. Um, the chunking algorithm will um, make sure that it uh, results mostly in the same chunks. And then the index becomes uh, very similar as well. So you can take implicit result without having any kinds of history information. Um, yeah, what you have there. And let's say you built a little IoT device, you download an image, and then you want to update. There's already an image you have, like the current version that you're running, that is very, very similar to the one that you're going to download. So you can use that as seed, right? Um, you can use what you already have as a pool of chunks that you already know are good. And then when, the, when you download the new index files, you first check, what do I already have? Use that and uh, only download from the internet what I don't have yet, right? So uh, um, it's, an, it's an automatic version of how, how the deltas generate basically um, as they happen, right? Like because you can take benefit of whatever you have regardless of what it is. You can even use this to do things like cross upgrading things. Like for example, you have one Debian image. Now you upgrade to Fedora. Um, and then uh, uh, lots of the data that is included in these images actually ends up being the same, like time zone data, locale data, and these kind of things. So um, this algorithm will automatically detect the similarities because the time zone data, regardless if you got it from Ubuntu or if you got it from Debian or got it from Fedora, it will result in the same chunks with the same ha hashes. So if you have those already, then you can actually share even between those completely uh, separately built things that actually share no history, no immediate history together. Um, and still take benefit of the fact that you already have that stuff. Um, one key here is there's no revision control necessary, right? Like the similarities between these trees are entirely automatically detected, right? Because, uh, yeah, we look at what the actual data is that's supposed to be delivered and find the similarities through cryptographic uh, primitives instead of having some kind of developer who says, this is version one, this is version two, this is version three, and when I upgrade something, I uh, prepare for you the diffs between these versions, and you have to upgrade through them. So yeah, the big thing here is no revision control necessary. It's much, much easier to uh, make a viable a disk image on some server this way, because you basically say, yeah, these are the chunks um, I, I want. Make sure that they're viable. There's a good chance they already are viable, but I don't know where they're from. It's fine. They're cryptographically secure. They um, can't come from everywhere as long as the hash matches. Everything's good. Yeah, and cross um, uh, is uh, is uh, cross updates are supported as well. I already mentioned that. A uh, key difference to Docker and OS3 is yeah, forget revision control. Like you don't have to ever manage upgrades on the server side anymore. All that you have to do is you put the index file for the current version and upload the additional chunks that you need for this. There you go, that's it. You don't have to have the server, the server doesn't have to be smart. It can be dumb, like it can be simplest HTTP 0.9 server ultimately. All it has to provide is the index file plus these chunks in the simplest get, uh, um, HTTP get fashion, right? So the server doesn't have to have, it doesn't need any kind of understanding of versioning of revision control or anything like this. Yeah, similarities are found automatically. Revision control is a wonderful tool, but I'm pretty sure it's only useful as a tool for developers. It's not tool for, uh, useful for, a tool for deployment. Um, I know that I've uh, put a lot of content already on you. I hope that at least some of it's stuck. Um, I much prefer, by the way, if we have, do questions in the middle of a talk instead of like only at the end. So uh, this is like a good spot probably to ask you if you have any questions so far. That's a question. Yeah. While concatenating those small files, uh, how do you arrange if they are concatenated already in the same folder? And then, if, if for example, it's just one small file, do you think that the whole chunk is not the value? Um, so, um, uh, like, I mean, the, the index file, it lists all the chunks. Like, oh, I was supposed to repeat the question, sorry. Um, do I have to? Did anybody not understand this? Nobody says anything? Okay, it's for the recording. Okay, but then now you have to re uh, say, ask again because I forgot it. Uh, you mentioned that uh, while uh, uh, the, the, the small files uh, are concatenated in order to make a bigger chunk, how do you arrange that all these uh, small files are always concatenated in uh, the same order? Okay, so the question was. Um, uh, in the algorithm, I um, concatenate multiple small files uh, to become a bigger chunk so that the chunks on average are always the same size. Um, how do I guarantee that they're always concatenated in the same order? This is exactly what the next slide is supposed to tell you. 
Um, it's the reason why I don't actually use tar. I mentioned earlier that I have tar, um, like something tar-like, but I'm not using tar. For precisely this reason, for, for the fact that tar is not reproducible, right? Like there are millions of different ways to tar up the same directory tree. Um, like you get different tables that all encode the very same data, right? Like it's not defined um, the order in which the files have to appear. And that basically means, um, yeah, that you don't have reproducibility. Reproducibility matters a lot to me, right? Like I, I care about the fact that the directory trees, when you um, put them together as a developer and when you deploy them on the machines ultimately, that they are guaranteed to be exactly the same, right? So hence, I chose not to use tar. I mean, there's other reasons not to use tar because I want actually, I want the ability that you can mount a, one of these index files, which is ultimately just a tar file, like that you can mount it locally, and as you access this mounted version of it, that the chunks are pulled from the internet, right? Like, so that you basically get a file system, like a remote file system, which is built on this um, kind of stuff. But as soon as you do that, you want an index, right? You, you, like, like you want a, ha like a, like a quicker look up to fi files in the archive, right? And tar doesn't give you that because tar is just a concatenation of files uh, with a little bit of metadata. So yeah, the guarantee, I want reproducibility. So my, my serialization of the file directory trees, it's, I called it CA tar, by the way, um, is very similar to tar, except that I define very, very clearly how files are to be serialized, and there's only one valid serialization of any um, uh, directory tree, right? So I basically say you have to sort the files alphabetically within each directory first, um, and you have to encode all the metadata in exactly this way, and um, yeah, and you can basically say for every bit, is that valid or is it not valid, and if it's not valid, it's uh, rubbish, right? Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, any other question at this? That's No, so I mean, this one is like, so the question was if I see it as a replacement or merging with rsync in the long term. The answer is a very clear no. It's a different tool. It takes the ideas but it's from Git and from rsync, but it's not going to replace either. It's a tool that works very differently, right? It's a tool for actually delivering images to people, and that's not really what rsync is so much about, right? Like, it introduces all the content like an index file and chunk store that make no sense for the use cases that people use rsync for. Like, rsync is probably the most most useful um, as an individualized thing, right? Like you have this one single occurrence where you want, as an administrator, rsync this from there, right? And then maybe you script it so it gets re repeated. But this stuff is really about um, having large numbers of, of instances around that take benefit of the fact um, that trees are similar and then upgrade. I mean, they're pretty sure that there are some use cases where people currently use rsync where they probably should better using ca sync. But in general, that's not the case. Like, for example, I, if I copy syncs around my own uh, devices, I would not use CA, CA uh, sync for that because that's not the, 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 the purpose of it, of the tool. So, yeah. Yes, you say that, for example, if we have a big image, yes, and before sending it out, we have to split it up into some level size chunks, yes? But how do you analyze the context of the file to estimate the maximum block size? Um, okay, so the question was um, when I uh, like the question was basically how the the chunking algorithm works, right? I, I mean that how do you analyze the context of the file of the, some image inside to split it up after that into small chunks, level size? Um, how I analyze the context um, uh, of the of the file that I'm supposed to to yeah. chunk up. Uh, to do the chunking. So the chunking algorithm, this bus hash algorithm, bus hash is a, is a hashing algorithm, right? And um, it is a hashing algorithm like any other in theory, but it has this nice uh, property that is very, very efficient to, um, to shift, like if you have the serialization stream, that you can um, move the, this, this, this uh, bus hash algorithm over every single byte of the stream, right? And it would tell you at any point what the hash of the stuff that's before it is, right? So the idea of, of the chunking algorithm is usually um, that you do this for every fucking byte, uh, sorry, for every single byte in the stream, and then uh, you calculate the hash, and if that hash um, uh, matches a certain math mathematic expression, it's actually the one that I had, whoa, I had on my slides here, but I skipped over because I presumed you weren't interested. Why doesn't this go back? Um, there we go. Um, it's this one. 
So what actually happens is basically that you, you now you have to think you, you calculate a hash basically over every single window over the entire stream. Then you test with an um, expression like this. H is the hash value modulo some value Q. And if it matches Q minus 1, then you decide this is where I, I uh, cut. Right? That's how you calculate the cut marks. This way to calculate this has the benefit that the same data results in the same hash. That's what hash functions are about. And hence, modulo the same, well, it would always result in the same modulo value. And then if, I, if this um, test holds, then I know I will always cut at the very same data at the same, very same place. That's the core of it. Um, read, I've met lots of papers on the internet, also Wikipedia article, read up on this. It's, it's, very, it's a very simple thing. Right? And it's, it's extremely useful, and people should be way more aware of that this even exists. Um, but the way, like the Q, um, the way you pick that is how you do, um, how you pick the average chunk size that you want, right? Because if Q is bigger, then the average chunk size will be larger. If you pick it smaller, it will be smaller, right? Like because you, you increase the chance that this um, uh, will hold. Yeah? Is, is that an answer? Any other question at this point? Otherwise, I would proceed with my slides. Um, OK, so yeah, I was talking about tar. Um, I already basically did get, went through this tar. So I'm not using tar. I use something that I call CA tar. It's very similar. Um, it does. Uh, Two major differences, I mean, this has a couple of other differences as well where I think one can be better than tar. But the two really important ones are reproducibility. I want that the same directory tree always exact same uh, image. Um, and the other one is random access. I want a little bit of, uh, I mean, not much, but I want a little bit of uh, the chance that when I read it back that I can seek to the right position without having to read the entire front of it like you have to do for tar. Um, yeah, random access is awesome because you can actually mount it. Um, yeah, a little bit of an overview how it actually feels in real life. Um, the CA sync tool will output a couple of files for you. One is CAIDX. That's the index file. That is ultimately just uh, the, the, the list of hashes that I mentioned. The CAIDX. That is uh, the same thing, actually. The only difference is, um, is whether the image that this is about is a block device or a file system tree. If it's a file system tree, the suffix is CAIDX. If it's from a block device, basically if it contains the raw bits of an XT4 file system or something, then it's a CAIDX. Um, internally, it's the same thing. It's just a way how I communicate to people whether they, uh, it's, it's something they can untar onto a file system or if it's something they have to DD on a block device. Um, CA tar is the raw directory tree serialization before I chunk it up. And CASTR is uh, the suffix I use for, for um, chunk store directories. And that's already everything that you actually care about. There are a couple of other things that it can throw out for you, but we don't really have to uh, discuss that because they're, they're not the more, more important, most important thing in the world. Something else that CA sync um, really cares about is metadata, right? On one hand, we want to be very, very precise with the file metadata that we store. File metadata is the obvious things, like the modification time, the, the access uh, bits, the, the ownership, and things like that. But depending on your use case, you actually care usually about a different set of metadata, right? So uh, yeah, CSync can be very precise, way more precise with um, saving and restoring information about um, files than TAR is. Like, it will store information about our subvolumes if you want that. It will, uh, like the Chatra bits and these kind of things. It's a, it's a long list, actually, of the individual bits it can store for you. This doesn't mean that that's always what you want. There's very explicit control that you pick exactly what you want. Why um, does that matter? Um, the reason is, like, uh, if you build an OS, right, and you want to deliver OS images, your VM images, your IoT trees to people, usually you don't care about the M time. The M time is actually a bad thing for you. It will actually, because let's say you, you build an image once, and the next day you build it as the same tool with GCC and Make and whatever you have a second time, then the M times will be different, even though technically the, the result is exactly the same, right? Like, and it, uh, yeah. So M times is something you explicitly don't want when you deliver OS trees. On the other hand, in the home directory, 
Like if you actually take systematic backups of your home directory and put them on some server, you do care about the amp time a lot because it's actually really useful information to know when you last edited something. So depending on your use case, sometimes some bits matter and others do not. Like for example, in my home directory, it doesn't matter who owns the files, right? Like that I have user ID 1000 on my laptop, but uh, user ID 1003 on my desktop doesn't really matter. They're my files, um, so I shouldn't store that bit of information. It's, it's information that basically only makes sense within the specific system then. So yeah, um, this is something that TAR doesn't allow you either, right? Like, I mean, it doesn't even allow you to save and restore all these bits, but it also give, doesn't give you the control about this. So yeah, end time is good for backup, bad for um, those images. Um, this is LaTeX artifact that it turned that in da dash dash into a dash, so ignore the fact that it's only a dash. But basically, it has a lot, a lot of with and without parameters, and you specify exactly with M time, um, with UID, with usernames, and things like that, or without, depending on what you want. By default, if you don't specify anything, it's as accurate as possible, by the way, which uh, might be good for some cases, but not for others. Um, something interesting to think about is, like, if we think about the block layer, right? Like, we stash a full file system image from the block layer into this stuff. Um, it will operate quite nicely and recognize similarities. But uh, if you think about IoT, usually people deliver this stuff with SquashFS. Like, for those who don't know, SquashFS is a compressed read-only file system supported by Linux. Um, in theory, um, compression is, like, really bad for everything I did before, right? Like, because um, uh, compression is supposed to remove redundancies, right? That's how it's defined. And if uh, there are no redundancies, that basically means that, um, yeah, everything, every, if you change one bit in the front of everything, and then we'll ripple to the entire rest, because if it didn't, then there would be redundancy. And also, all the similarities that this tool is supposed to find aren't there anymore. So, um, in theory, pushing SquashFS into CA Sync, I mean, will work, but it will not have to give you much benefit about um, reducing what you actually download. However, um, it's actually not that bad. The reason for that is that uh, SquashFS is actually a, uh, a, uh, um, a file system where it compresses individual blocks um, up to a certain size, and then it compresses the next blocks, because it needs that, because file systems um, on Linux are random access, so it needs to be able to jump in the middle of, of uh, some block, and if it would um, compress everything from top to bottom, that would be very difficult, because it would have to um, unpack everything from the top first. So, uh, and that's actually interesting, because that basically means they compress a bit, then compression stops and gets restarted, and they compress a bit, and then it stops and restarts. And because that's the way it is, we can take benefit of this and synchronize the chunk size that CA Sync wants to work on, like the average chunk size, with the one that SquashFS generates, and it actually works quite well. But it really depends on, uh, yeah, you have to tune a little bit there. I already mentioned that reproducibility is everything for me. Um, or for CI Sync, like I want that the same archives are always generated for the same trees, and it's bit by bit the exact same thing. Um, as a as a side effect of this, it's actually really nice that uh, like I exposed a couple of commands like CI Sync Digest, and CI Sync M tree that uh, use this information, the fact that I hash everything, and the fact that I um, uh, have this so well defined so that you can actually calculate a hash over an entire directory tree. What happens in the background is it will serialize it, run SHA-256 uh, or SHA-512 slash 256 over it, um, throw away all the stuff that is serialized and just print out the hash. So it's actually, it's already, like even if you don't care about uh, uh, tarring up things and distributing them, it's actually a really, really useful tool just to get very, very quickly um, the um, the, the digest of a directory tree. And similar, there's CA sync M tree. I'm not sure if you know M tree. M tree is some form, some, it's a command that is a default on FreeBSD or something. It's short for manifest tree. It's supposed to, it's basically it's a file format that the BSD people defined um, that lists all the files in a directory tree and the hashes and a couple of attributes. Because this information is readily available, it's kind of what is uh, the CA tar format is very easy to convert between the two, right? Like an M3 file doesn't include the, the contents, though, even though the CA tar thing do, does. So I added that as well. It's kind of cool because you can actually then verify the validity of your tree with tools that are not CA sync, but something that BSD people came up with. What's also interesting is um, because 
as mentioned, I do the seeding thing, right? Like you have already the version number one on your system or a very similar container. Now I use that as a seed for downloading the next version of the container or some related container or something like that. Um, because I have that and I know exactly where I'm copying the data from if I can copy it, I can actually take benefit of this to um, optimize how I put things onto disk. Specifically, I can recreate things as hard links, right? This is kind of what OS Street does, right? It will, if you check out something from OS Street, it will just hard link some, uh, all those files into um, uh, the, the, the OS Street repository. I can do the same, but with anything. Like, you give me something as a seed, you say you want hard links, then it will hard link whatever it can from the existing version and just put as new files the stuff that got, got, got from the internet. Now, hard links are very special in like the way you can use them because, yeah, it means read-only because if it's not read-only, then you have the weird propagation between the trees that you don't want. But what's more interesting is uh, that CSync also can do ref links. Ref links, I'm sure you guys know that. Ref links is a file system feature that is um, uh, more recently added, like Butterfest has, has been doing that for a long time. Uh, now XFS can that, do that too. What ref links are basically is a way how you can, can have two files that share the same data or partially the same data on disk. And as um, you go through one file and write to that data, it gets automatically um, duplicated. So you basically get something like copy and write, right? You, you can reduce the disk space used, um, but to the, to the, to the um, applications, it looks like things that aren't copies, but actually the same thing, are actually copies. Because at the moment where you actually try to write the, um, two things, they get automatically du duplicated. It's a very nice way how you can save disk space um, if you have, very, uh, have many repetitive tree like we do have. So yeah, say so I think we'll do this automatically for you. If you have one seed and you download a new version, use that thing as a seed, then uh, it will reflink away. It will much prefer creating reflinks for everything over uh, actually writing blocks to disk. Um, yeah. No. So a ref link is something we, we, we optimize if you have it, like we take benefit if you have it when you replay things, but uh, the fact that ref links are used is an implementation detail of the, of the extractor. Uh, it does not show up in the file format. So if you use it from X4, it will be duplicated? Yeah, I mean, on X4, ref links are not supported, so if you, if you extract on X4, you don't get any benefit, but if you extract on ButterFS or XFS, you, you, there you are, you get all your ref links. So that's kind of cool, actually, because it basically means you can have um, 500 container images, and they don't have to share a common history, but they will automatically, just because you used one that you already had as a seed for extracting the ones that you want, uh, you'll share, make them share the data on disk. So um, the price for a single container is much, much lower. Um, the CI sync tool can uh, operate locally, right? Like you have your index and your chunk store, um, and you have them local file system will work fine with then extract them locally. Can also um, automatically acquire both the index and the individual stores from various protocols. Currently, we support FTP, HTTP, blah, the usual shit. Um, so uh, this is actually kind of nice because you basically, yeah, you, now all you have to do is you maintain a store, see a, like a chunk store somewhere on the internet, and put the index file somewhere, and then people can download their stuff and see, I think. Um, can even download the individual chunks all in parallel, so you can actually saturate your links perfectly and download the image. Um, yeah, always using what you already have as a source. Some other things it can do, it can implicitly do UID git shift, which is useful for if you do user namespacing containers. So while extracting or while packing things up, you can um, like uh, subtract or add some fixed value from all the UIDs. Um, yeah, something that's also really, really awesome is there's CA sync MK dev, right? So basically, with this command, you can say, uh, I want to um, create a local virtual block device that, uh, when you access it, gives back the contents of uh, myblockimage.caibx, like of the, like the, that basically gives back whatever this index file encodes, right? This is really, really awesome because uh, this will automatically in the background down, download the chunks that are missing locally, use the chunks that are already locally available in some seed, and give you a block device that feels like a true block device. You can just do, M, like you can't write to it, but you can mount it. Like you can uh, do mount, um, 
uh, that block device that is being created through this, usually called def NB, uh, uh, network block device, NBD0. Um, and then uh, there you are. You have mounted it. And uh, as you access it, in the background, the chunks that you're accessing will be pulled down as well into a local cache of some form. Um, but actually, it will also, at a lower priority, download the entire image um, from the background. You can actually use this to, to even boot from CA sync things, right? I've never actually implemented that, but there's nothing stopping us from, from doing this, right? So where you basically say, yeah, I want to boot exactly that um, a version of the block device that is identified by this index. There you go. You use whatever you have locally cached. The rest you get from the internet. And as you boot up, chunks are requested. And if there's any instant where there's nothing to do, it will download the rest uh, in the background to make sure that there's a good chance that later on it's already there. Similar to this, I mean, this is what you do with CABX files. Again, those are the, the index files that belong to a serialization of a block device. You can do the equivalent if you have an index file that belongs to the serialization of a directory tree. Again, that's the CAIDX suffix. Um, in that case, it's uh, mounting. You do that, and that's kind of what you think what it would do. It takes that index file, downloads it, downloads the chunks it needs, and mounts it into a file system. Of course, this thing will be read only, right? I'm always reading about, uh, talking here about immutability, um, and that means it's all read only. But you have it locally. Now. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's really, really awesome stuff because it actually, if you turn that into a backup system, then this is the way how you can basically make the versions um, available locally that you backed up yesterday. And you can just access them, and you don't even have to decompress, um, like extract it in full, but you can just go to the one file that you actually cared for, and it will only download the chunks that you already have using what you already have already in your seed in your current version of your home directory, and will be efficient and awesome and minimized. Um, there's a couple of other features that are also kind of cool. Like, for example, um, you know, if you serialize a block device, usually it's a very bit, bit bad idea to just do that the way it is because um, quite often the file systems on block devices are much smaller than the block devices themselves are, especially in IoT, because you want to have the ability to grow a file system as you go. Um, CSync is actually kind of smart. It understands um, the super blocks of quite a number of file systems. Um, and we'll actually figure out the real file system size and then only read the blocks that are actually defined in there. So, yeah, um, I got like less than five minutes time. Anybody has any questions at this point in time? Yes, uh, thank you, Mark, about find holes in the file system. Does CSC support that? And the, the second one is, does it support the zero out mechanism? Okay, so the question was uh, about uh, punching holes in files and the zero out mechanism and if CSC supports that. So. Um, this is similar to the raffling stuff, actually. Whenever CA sync extracts um, chunks of zeros, it will not extract them. Instead, it will uh, punch a hole in the file. So the idea is always that um, during extraction, you get the best possible thing on disk, right? With referenced as much as possible using reflinks and the zeros as holes in the files, right? So it's, it's supposed to be the most efficient way. The corollary of that, by the way, is even though CA Sync is very accurate in what it serializes in the, in, the, in the serializations, what it does not serialize is where are holes and where are reflinks, because that's what it creates while extracting implicitly, right? But it's explicitly optimized for what you're asking for. Any question other than that? If not, oh, there's one. So the question was whether there are any link layer requirements or and whether you can compress things further. So the chunks themselves are always uh, compressed, right? They're always, um, you have three to choose from. The default one is the Facebook one, that STD. Um, but uh, ultimately, you know, CA Sync currently supports FTP and these kind of things, but I actually don't, like, CA Sync doesn't really care what you plug in the back end in there. You can do anything. It just needs to be the most simple um, uh, access protocol. It needs to be something where you can say, give me that file from somewhere, um, and that's it. And this file that you get is either the index file or it's um, the, the chunks. Um, it doesn't make much sense to compress this again because the chunks are already compressed, like the real data is already compressed. But knock yourself out, you can totally do that. Um, and you can plug at the back end whatever you want. Like, for example, we currently don't ship that, but it would, for example, make a lot of sense to have a back end that um, uh, pushes data directly into Amazon S3. Right? And this is actually what I'm, like, with the future thing, it's what I want. I want 
um, to make this useful not only as a way how to distribute images to other people, but also to do backups very efficiently. The big thing for backups is the cryptography. This one does not encrypt anything, right? Like, that's because you don't need it if you want containers that generally are not encrypted. I mean, I'm not saying that might not be useful, but it's not how it's currently being used. So um, I want to, uh, like, it's a generic tool. It's supposed to be a little bit more generic. So it's, I'm going to add the cryptography that then it's going to be like a little like tools like BUP and uh, the other ones, uh, RESTIC and things like that, but also very different. Um, yeah, and also a couple of other things need to be done and to make it useful for backup is, is um, serializing a directory every uh, 10 minutes, which is what I want to go for. Like, I want to make backups so cheap that you can do backups every 10 minutes without paying much for it. But if you do this and you serialize the entire home directory every 10 minutes, then that's a heavy I.O. load you're creating. So what I, what I currently worked on, it's, it's finished actually now, is um, uh, speeding that up so that we only need to stop things on disk. And if we already had that specific file directory hashed before, we can just use that information if it didn't change and, instead of having to always serialize and rechunk everything. So the question was regarding ButterFS send and receive, if we can take benefit of this. We cannot. Like, I, I don't know. I'm not sure where ButterFS is going, so I didn't want to add too, too much uh, ButterFS uh, specifics in that area. But I also, um, it's, a, it's a different kind of information, right? Like, because, again, they will spit the history on us. I don't care about the history, right? I, this is all about um, recognizing similarities in data automatically without having any information about history between them, right? So this data is different from what I actually want. What I want from Linux file systems is that they tell us um, that something below some directory tree has changed since the last time I looked at it, but that's not butter send receives the data. Okay, um, one minute, so if anybody has a question, they have a question. Uh, like, so the question was, uh, how have I verified that this works with current registries? What do you mean by registries? Like, well, I mean, uh, uh, the question was whether I had tested it with a, uh, a, a OpenShift uh, registry. The thing is, this is this is a, a basic building block that you build stuff from, right? It's it's supposed. It's not something that actually, like, I mean, something you can turn into something that you distribute um, uh, uh, container images with, but it's not going to do that for f f automatically for you. It's not supposed to. It's way more low level, right? So, and, and all these registries in the world, they don't use this tool, right? Like, first of all, because it's new, and secondly, because it's probably very hard to convince everybody that this is the way to go, even though it is the way to go. But, um, yeah, so no, I have not tested this. Uh, CI Sync comes with a extensive test suite because I mentioned that I want this the reproducibility thing, right? I want that, for example, if you if you tar something up today and you or like you you CI Sync something up today and you unpack it tomorrow, that it's bit exact what you have, have on the disk uh, is the same thing again. And I also want that if you then expose it through the through the uh, CI Sync mount. And then what you have mounted there, it packs that app again that you get back the original version that you have mounted there. So the test suite has lots of tests like this, right? So they basically, we work from a, from a directory tree, which is tar it up and uh, tar it down and then do diffs and diffs and diffs to make sure that um, everything is the way it should be reproducible. Anyway, this is uh, all time I have. Thank you very much for your interest. If you have any further questions, uh, ask questions outside. Thank you very much.